Hi all, thank you all for, uh, for joining my session uh, today at NC Sydney. Um, I'm Jan Vries, I'm a Cloud Solution Architect at a small consulting firm in, uh, based in the Netherlands, um, where I do a lot of Azure consulting, uh, from being uh, migrating to on-premises to the cloud, expanding the, the, their Azure ecosystem, uh, stuff like this. So very exciting. And one thing I come across quite often is, well, setting up the security at, at my customers, at my projects. And uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about today, setting up your the security of your uh, application environment and making this in a better state as well, uh, something yeah, I come across quite often. I have to say, uh, I've been designing uh, Azure environments also in, in a, well, bad way. Uh, with, well, without any security, uh, what that matter. Uh, well, at least we had some security, but uh, it, it looked a bit like, like this, uh, drama of such an architecture. As you can see, I have a web application and the internet, and my app services are directly exposed to the internet and my web application, along with the SQL storage accounts and functions all being well, in the in the public uh, cloud in, in within Azure, uh, and this works quite well. And you might have such a such an architecture, such a Azure design also, and it's not bad per se. But uh, I once had an infrastructure person came by, and he told me, "Well, you know, everything is public at the moment right now, right?" And I was like, "Yeah, well." No matter, but th that doesn't matter much, I think, because Azure is doing some security stuff and having some AI logic uh, and, and all kind of fancy key fancy stuff and fancy keywords, uh, making sure my environment is protected. And he was like, well, not really. Sure, uh, Azure and the engineers uh, working on Azure are making sure uh, the Azure environment in total is secure and they do some protection of your Azure uh, applications, your applications within Azure. But still, you need to do something yourself because this is our public footprint at the moment, or at least was in my, uh, my designs, my projects. And I guess you all have seen such a thing yourselves also. So your website is public, your backend APIs is public, but also your repositories like SQL Server, like storage accounts, uh, stuff like this, and even backend workers like function apps, if they have an, well, if they have an HTTP endpoint that is. Uh, so that's the public footprint of, of such designs, which work and are quite uh, useful from a developer perspective. But from a security perspective, this footprint is quite large. Um, just for the for the people who haven't uh, haven't seen this, uh, I've created a well a, a Visual Studio solution with uh, with a couple of uh, function apps, so an uh, enterprise app, starter app away from web, and a starter app public web. Uh, and all they do is. Uh, well, this is the default function app with the default HTTP triggered function. Uh, you post or send a name to it. Uh, it retrieves a name and sends back a message. So the, the function from my exposed function app, Jan, is being triggered successfully. So just to show you, um, I've deployed this to, to Azure <laughs> and I'm now invoking, will invoke uh, this function, sending my name to it hello from my exposed function app. As you can see, this is the address of a function app, or at least my function app. You all can invoke this and it will invoke directly my function app being exposed to the internet. And this works and I definitely do this for, for some customers, but it's open and no protection whatsoever. So. That's that's could be bad, especially 
once you realize this is true for all environments. If you are working in a traditional environment with a dev, test, acceptance, and production environment, uh, you probably have those exposed. Also, uh, at one point in time, I had a customer where our testing site was the number one in the Google search results and the production site was second. Uh, so that was uh, quite bad. Uh, we, we did some uh, uh, fixes for this uh, just to make sure it didn't show up in the, in the search uh, uh, indexes anymore, the test and dev and acceptance environment. But still, it's open and it can happen, especially if the search engines don't respect your safety measures for this. Uh, so that's quite bad. And especially considering your repositories are out in the open also, so like SQL, like storage accounts, like Cosmos, like everything which holds data and most of the time the data is the most important part of your uh, solution or at least for the customers i'm working with data is key and the services are just a way to get to the data um, and some of you might have seen uh, a couple of options within a sql server sql azure uh, to lock it down a bit and uh, this is a, a sample uh, for it let me get the laser pointer so we all have client ip addresses uh, we all have ips and you can whitelist them uh, over here and have a big list of ip addresses of people of, of well ip addresses who can access your uh, sql server which is fine it's it's a way of protection uh, and you can also allow Azure services to access uh, the server. So that's that's the most basic type of protection you can have on a SQL server. This is a production server, as you can see. And this client IP address list had like such a long list of IPs. And I just joined uh, this team. And I the first day I saw this, I already noticed five IP addresses of people who weren't working there anymore. And another seven of IP addresses who we didn't know who they were from because they started with client IP underscore something something. Um, so we don't know who has access to this server. Uh, so it can easily be fixed by just deleting them and adding them again when necessary. Uh, but also this one, it, uh, it struck me or I thought, well, this is now my, my SQL server is protected and only Azure services can access this and the client uh, IP specified over here. And that's true. But this allow Azure services isn't scoped to your own tenant or subscription. It's all of Azure. Which means if I have a virtual machine within my own subscription, I can access this production, uh, production server because it allows Azure services to connect to it. Sure, you still need to log in with some username and password, but I can make a connection to it, which is, well, uh, which could be a security uh, vulnerability. So that's something, uh, something you should know. So best thing is just to deny public network access, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, and I thought, well, Azure is doing some kind of protection like the DDoS protection. And that's true. Uh, you standard, everyone has the DDoS protection basic in their subscription, which is doing some, some monitoring and, and uh, automatic attack mitigations, which is useful because that's stuff you don't get for free on premises uh, most of the time. Uh, but it's, well, as the name suggests, it's quite basic. Uh, to get DDoS protection standard, uh, you get a lot of, well, a, a lot of more options uh, for reporting for metrics, also cost protection, which can be quite useful because as we all probably know, uh, within the cloud, uh, automatic scaling is one of the key benefits. Uh, like take, for example, Azure Functions, if you have a function, it will scale automatically to hundreds of instances uh, when necessary. Uh, but it does something to the cost of your solution. So if you don't want to have, well, uh, surprises at the end of the month, 
cost protection is useful, you can just cap, I can imagine you can just cap your Azure function instances to only scale to 10, 20 instances, probably. But also metrics and alerts are useful. If you see a spike in traffic, you want probably want to be notified uh, of it uh, because, well, it's useful information. So that's the standard DDoS protection. Uh, it comes for about $3,000 per month, uh, which is, well, a lot of money, uh, but it, it's for all of your subscriptions within the tenant. So if you have one or a dozen uh, subscriptions, you just have to buy a DDoS protection a standard once per tenant, and it will cover all of your subscriptions. So that spreads the cost a bit. Still, I've not used it at any of my customers yet. Uh, maybe we'll do it at one moment in time, but uh, I haven't uh, implemented this yet because we're doing things a bit different at the moment, uh, which I'll show you uh, as, as this session uh, uh, continues. So the first thing I'm doing at customers right now, just to protect their data, or at least to some kind of protection is moving away the the uh, data repositories from the public internet by well surrounding it with a nice uh, virtual network. This means uh, the the SQL Server, the the storage accounts, the Cosmos DB, everything can't be uh, uh, yeah you can't connect to it anymore via uh, the public endpoint, the public uh, public uh, names. Uh, and only services allowed connect, to connect to your virtual network can connect to it. So this is the first step you need to do, or at least I'm doing at the moment. You can even uh, add a, a nice private link to most uh, services, which means uh, that you have a secure private endpoint to a specific service, which is very useful once you expand uh, your environment to multiple virtual networks, uh, multiple clouds, multiple whatever, uh, very useful. So your data can be accessed via those private links, which I won't be covering today, uh, but it's a useful feature uh, to know it's it's there. Uh, so to set this up, uh, we need, uh, because uh, now your data repositories, uh, you can't connect to them anymore. So now you need to, well, make sure your app services and your function app is able to connect to them. Uh, and this can be done with something called a VNet integration. With VNet integration, you're stating, well, my secure function app can now connect to the virtual network and use all of its uh, data repositories, all of its services which are located uh, in it. Uh, very useful. So as you can see, it's it's a bit small, but uh, if you if you zoom in, you can probably see secure function app is now in a subnet or, or my secure function app JV is in a secure function app a subnet in a specific uh, VNet. So the naming isn't very important. It's just the idea. So this is good, or at least this is a great starting point. And I recommend you doing this right away if you haven't done it already. Uh, but still, your APIs are exposed, which could be a bad thing, which could be a good thing, depending on what type of solution you have. Um, so one way to get them away from the internet is by adding a API management before or adding API management to the mix. Um, so an API management is like a, a proxy or can act as a proxy for incoming uh, requests to your APIs. So this looks a bit like this uh, when adding it to a VNet. So as you can see, I have API management and everyone, the my website and, and my, the internet is connecting to API management and all of my services are within or at least uh, can only be connected from uh, from within my VNet. So API management has one public uh, public facing endpoint and has one foot in the the virtual network, which it uses to connect to my my APIs and my my functions. 
Uh, so this is quite nice because now no one is able to connect to my APIs anymore. And I only have incoming traffic from within API management. To set this up, um, you need to uh, set API management up uh, as an external, uh, well, external facing, which means you have one part in uh, the public internet, one part within your VNet. You can also set this up as an internal API management, but that means it's only can only be accessed from within your uh, VNet, uh, which is also useful, but not re uh, not relevant for the, for this uh, this picture. Uh, and of course, within your app services and within your well uh, function apps, you need to add some access restriction. Only traffic allowed from API management, in this case, the API management uh, uh, subnet, is allowed to connect to my my uh, functions, my APIs. Uh, all other traffic will be denied, as you can uh, see in these extra restrictions. Uh, so this is now no one or, uh, is allowed on my uh, my uh, app services anymore. <clears throat> There's also a different extra restriction you can use, which is by using service tags and only allowing API management to connect to this. Uh, this is useful because now you don't have to use uh, virtual networks anymore. Especially from a pricing perspective, this is useful uh, because having API management, uh, being able to connect to a VNet or being integrated to, in a VNet uh, means you need to have the premium, uh, yeah, the premium pricing uh, uh, of API management, which is about twenty four hundred dollars per month, which is again a lot of money. And with by using service tags, you can work with the basic or the standard tier, which is, uh, if I remember correctly, about forty bucks or six hundred bucks. Uh, downside from using service tags is just like with the SQL uh, server protection allow Azure services, this is for all of Azure. So if I'm having an API management instance within my own subscription, I would now be able to connect to the, the secured uh, APIs I have. So when, when using this, you need to set up some middleware of your own or some, well, protection, some, some checks of your own. Uh, to check if the requests are uh, coming from your own API management instance or your allowed API management instance. So that's something you need to know when setting this up. It can save you a lot of money. <clears throat> so now we have this, uh, this in place, and this actually works quite well. And I'm a big fan of using API management, but I can imagine the, the pricing is, is a bit expensive or a bit expensive for uh, some customers. So let, let me show you how, how this works. Uh, so the same function, uh, we have the same function and I have this, this uh, private function, which is has an exit restriction uh, for only allowing traffic from, uh, from uh, within the VNet. And as you can see, my web app is unavailable. Uh, I'm not allowed to connect to this. So 403 IP forbidden. Well, that's a nice message. When invoking this via API management, over here, API management starter, uh, the, the same query string, I will get a response. Hello from within our VNet, Jan. And this is exactly what I want. I only want to have traffic from API management to my API and not directly. How this looks in Azure? Well, I have, um, obviously I have uh, my, my function app, uh, as you can see in the networking tab, like I've shown you in the slides, I have VNet integration implemented. So this function is able to connect to all of my resources uh, within the VNet, like SQL Server. At the moment, the function isn't doing anything with it because it just takes the request data and responds with a, a nice message. But I, at least I can connect uh, to it. And I have this access restriction in place. Whoa. Uh, and as you can see, it's uh, allowing API management uh, subnet 
traffic. So back to the dashboard, and this is uh, well the, the application network is very next next finishy over here. So I have this uh, subnet where one for API management and one for uh, for the web applications. In an actual production environment, you probably want to think a bit about uh, what IP range you're using, uh, the necessary IP addresses, because having 250 available is nice because I can, but some, probably not something you need in, in production, especially since app services can scale to 250 instances and functions neither, or at least from a Last time I've read, it scales to about 200 instances, so you don't need uh, so many. But that's that's up to you. So, and over here, the API management starter. Uh, also, next, next, finishy. Uh, I have implemented uh, the function app over here by adding the function app. And as you can see, it's uh, it's over here, the starter app away from web, just like in uh, in our uh, uh, Visual Studio solution, and it's uh, well, it's available over here as a get and a post. And as I mentioned, I've added the, the virtual network integration over here, external, so I can connect with externally, and uh, connect it to the API management subnet. So cool stuff, and this is great. Uh, when, when possible, I strive uh, to have uh, this kind of a setup uh, and to take it even a step further to, because now we don't actually have a lot of protection. Well, our apps are, aren't exposed to the internet anymore, only via API management, but API management doesn't do a lot of protection. Uh, you can do some throttling with it, uh, with, with subscriptions, but by default, it doesn't do a lot if you don't add uh, policies, th that is. Uh, so what you can do is add an application gateway in front of uh, API management. So this means you can uh, set API management to be internal in the virtual network, so uh, in virtual network settings. So it can only be connected to internally via internal uh, endpoints and have application gateway uh, in front which can connect to the VNet also in, a, in, a, in the zone subnet and then connect to API management. And what an application gateway does is, well, it, it can act as a, uh, as a security uh, measure because it has some integrated uh, firewall inside it, but also has some routing rules uh, you can, you can uh, add to it and a lot of other nice, nice stuff, uh, which is cool because uh, application gateway is meant to do HTTP and HTTPS traffic uh, security. Uh, it can, one of the cool features is it can detect SQL injection attacks in your HTTP request. So it does some message inspecting, uh, which is cool. If you still have a solution which has a possibility for SQL injection uh, and a lot of other OWASP uh, top 10 or maybe even top 20 issues uh, which it can detect and uh, act upon. Uh, it also has capability of, of SSL offloading. I'm not sure why you would want this because, yeah, why? Uh, but but it's a possibility. Uh, so this is this is when you have this expensive, well, yeah, expensive API management solution. It's easy to add uh, App Gateway also because it's, well, not that expensive. Uh, it's only about 300 bucks per compute unit, which is, well, peanuts compared to the API management you're already paying for. Um, when using this though, you don't need API management. You can also do some routing within uh, your App Gateway and connect to it to your, your backends. But that's not something, well, as I mentioned, I'm an API management uh, fan, so I'd always use API management because it offers some other uh, benefits. Uh, but do know it's possible to do uh, to connect uh, your, your apps to App Gateway also. And you might be wondering, uh, Jan, 
why have you used the application gateway? Because, gateway? because I've heard great stories about the front door, it, because it has a CDN, it also has an integrated WAF, uh, you also get some DDoS protection, uh, and, and a lot of other cool stuff. And sure, I'm uh, also a big fan of front door because of all of these reasons, but it can't connect to a virtual network. That means your your when using front door, your whole environment is still exposed to the internet. There are some uh, some ways around this though, uh, but in the, the current setup I have uh, over here, it's a, it's a major downfall uh, downside. So what you can do, and, and especially if you're working globally, uh, is having a, a setup like this. Uh, so having your clients connect to front door and front door connect to your app gateway. And then the same, the same as before app gateway connecting to the rest of your environment. And this is cool. Uh, from the, both front door and, uh, application gateway, both have, uh, an integrated firewall. So that's, well, now you have double security measures. Uh, so you can turn it, might be able to turn it off at, at one point. And you can set up app gateway to only allow front door uh, traffic. So that's, well, not so app gateway isn't that exposed to, to the public anymore. And then this way you get the benefits of front door, like, like the global, the CDN and uh, the dynamic app acceleration, which is cool. It's just, it's, it feels, it feels a bit like now I have two services doing much of the same. Uh, they both also have differences though. Uh, App Gateway has some benefits compared to Front Door and Front Door compared to App Gateway. So this is a valid setup, especially if you're going global and have multiple regions. Uh, so you can have, have this in multiple regions in the world and Front Door as a, well, reverse proxy connecting to all of your environments, uh, which are uh, globally. So to, to save a bit of money, you can also do something like this. Uh, so only having front door and take advantage of the, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the security uh, features in front door and use it fully and let it connect to my API management instance, uh, via, via, uh, the, the service stack, uh, or, or maybe even via networking rules. And this is a great way to save 300 bucks, uh, especially, uh, which I found out uh, last week is in front door, your firewall rules, your security measures are handled on the edge. That means even before uh, traffic is being uh, sent to your API management instance or whatever you're connecting it to your security measures are well done locally for, for the, the person, uh, connecting to it. So your complete application environment isn't, uh, bothered with malicious, uh, uh, requests. Very useful. So to set this up, um, I started with an NSG, uh, network security group. And because I only want to allow, uh, HTTPS traffic, I've, uh, set this up. Uh, this NSG is placed on in the, the subnet of my API management. And this energy looks a bit like this. What I'm doing over here is I'm using the service stack for front door backend and allowing it to connect, uh, to the, well, the subnet where this energy is placed on, uh, very useful, or at least for me, this is very useful, but as I mentioned, now every front door backend is able to connect to my API management instance. And just like, like I said uh, before, uh, now you need to add some middleware, some logic, uh, to make sure traffic coming in is from your own front door. So with an API management, you can do a check header policy. And over here, I'm checking the header X Azure FDAB, uh, and checking it if the value is this, this GUID, this is the GUID of my, uh, my own, uh, front door instance. 
And if it doesn't match, I get a 403. So that's cool. And that's the only thing you need, or at least to, for this setup. Uh, while you're in, uh, while you're configuring API management, it might also make sense to, uh, or at least I think it makes sense to add subscriptions to all of your API, all of your products, uh, because, uh, if you don't know already with, with subscriptions, you can, uh, apply some policies to it. Like, uh, take, for example, if you have a bronze, silver and, and gold tier of, of people connecting or partners connecting uh, to your API, um, you can set the amount of requests they can make. Uh, so the gold tier can probably do a dozen requests and the silver a bit less and the bronze even, even less. And this is a great way to start monetizing your API and e I recommend setting subscriptions to required through immediately because it makes life easier in the future when you're ready to start monetizing because most of the time at the start of project, you don't, you aren't even thinking about it, uh, but might be something, uh, which will happen later on. And when having this in place already, it will help you in the future. And when you have front door or application gateway in front, you can add a default, uh, rule to it. Uh, uh, like I, like I did over here, a, a default rule. If the subscription key isn't present, just add it. This is a default subscription, uh, which has unlimited access to all of my APIs, but it makes sure all of my APIs are protected with a subscription key already. And whenever necessary, I can just, uh, just update the subscription key or, or uh, remove this rule and make sure everyone connecting needs to specify the subscription key by themselves if I would ever want this. So it, it opens up a lot of possibilities for you to use in the future, maybe right now, depending on the client and, and the, the project uh, you're working on. Uh, this is something, uh, well, when setting up this type of solution, I always have subscriptions to true. Uh, so to show you, I've set this up, back to my Azure subscription. Is well again. I have uh, still have the the secure function app, uh, which has uh, the networking set to well the same the same as before. So this is a different function network with different uh, uh, subnets. But uh, I've I've used the same names. So network API management only allow API management and Fnet integration for the reasons to connect to my data repositories. And over here, I have API management, uh, the enterprise client, which is much the same as, as before. Um, I have the Azure function with again, the, the name stuff. So run. Okay. So I, I might have changed the, the name of the APIs, but uh, as you can see, I have to check header over here and what I'm doing is I'm checking the header for the GUID. Um, so this is useful for, for this scenario. And over here I have front door connecting, well, front door as my, my front, uh, which I, I will be able, which I'll use to connect to, um, rule set. Yeah. So here I have, uh, one rule as you can see. I'm doing the API subscription key, adding it to it with a header value and sending that this to, to API management. And energy, like I've shown you in the slide, uh, this is one big energy, uh, allowing port 443, uh, for front door with the service stack. And while doing this, I discovered you need some, some basic ports, some, some basic stuff to be open, to be allowed to connect to your Azure services. Otherwise Azure will break, or at least your services will break. Uh, so these are some basic infrastructure services, uh, you need, uh, to allow to, uh, to your services. Otherwise uh, you can't do any rollouts anymore. Health monitoring is broken uh, stuff like this. So the, the basic stuff you want, uh, 
you want to work. And I discovered you need to allow port 3443 because this is the port the Azure portal is using to connect to your API management uh, uh, instance uh, and uh, show you the state of API management within the Azure portal. If you don't allow this port, the, the portal, uh, the API management UI doesn't work anymore. Uh, so I discovered this the hard way. All of this is written in the documentation. So you can find all of the IP ranges, all of the uh, ports which are available for API management. It's just, I hardly read the docs until I stumble across a, a an error. And then it's obviously pointed out in the docs you need to whitelist these IP uh, addresses and these uh, ports in order for stuff to work. So this is all, uh, all written down quite nicely. Uh, in a production environment, you probably want to do this in, in multiple energies and setting all of them up uh, in a, on a subnet. Uh, for demo purposes, I've placed them in, in one big one at the moment because it makes uh, it a be, bit easier to explain. Uh, so that's it. So to Postman, just to show you what happens. So I have, uh, this is the, the enterprise uh, block. So when connecting to API management directly now, uh, which I have the policy on to uh, only allow XFDID uh, of a specific, uh, with a specific GUID, and I have the energy uh, on top of it. Uh, and then she makes sure this, this invocation can't, uh, uh, can't be done anymore because I'm not, or my machine isn't a front or backend. Uh, so this, uh, this will time out eventually, even when specifying the subscription key. Uh, so this takes a bit in the meantime, I'll also be doing the front, uh, request to front door. Um, without a subscription key, because users don't want to uh, uh, specify a subscription key, or at least don't need to if they don't want to. And you can see, hello from the enterprise, Jan. So, yeah, because of the cost, I've named this an enterprise solution because your your local your local uh, store probably can't afford uh, solutions like this. Um, so this is from the enterprise. And I can even change it to, whoop, whoops, uh, well, three. well, this isn't the valid subscription key, obviously, because you need to do it, but now I will get a different uh, response. Access denied to due to an invalid subscription key. And this is because in my rule, I'm checking if the subscription key is present, don't override it. If it isn't set it. So now. I can't connect to it, and this also means I can do some uh, some rolling of uh, subscription keys in the future when necessary. This one should have timed out already. Yes, it's timed out because I'm well, not a front door backend. So cool, cool stuff. Or at least I think it's cool stuff. Uh, but the cost is well, it's it's. As I mentioned during the session, it's a bit much for some customers, for some projects. Um, so the, the cheapest solution is, and something I started with is putting all of your data resources in a single or in a VNet so it's not exposed to the public anymore. This is something you can get started with right away. And I uh, surely recommend you doing this Monday first thing or maybe next sprint, because it, if you haven't done so already, because it makes sure your data is, well, more protected. It's less exposed. And then, depending on the type of customer, I and me being an API management fanboy, uh, I'd start with service tech or uh, VNet integration with, with API management just to protect your uh, applications or uh, to not to protect, but to move your applications away from the public internet and only have a single point of entry. Uh, depending on the on the pricing tier or, or on, on the tier you're using, basic is 125 euros, uh, standard is about 600 euros. Uh, so, and 
as I mentioned, the fee, if you want a fee net integration, which I highly recommend, you're spending about 2,400 euros per month for API management. Then, adding the application gateway in the mix, sets you back another 300 euros per compute unit of application gateway, which might be worth it to you, uh, depending on, as I mentioned, the type of customer and project. And obviously adding front door, which will set you back at, well, another 100 to 300 uh, euros, depending on which type of front door you're using, the standard or uh, premium feature, the, the preview front door that is. You can also do it without the application gateway, which is what I'm using because this is my personal subscription and I really, I want it to be as cheap as possible, um, like a lot of customers. So this is good enough for uh, lots of customers. You only have one API management policy, one NSG, uh, and it'll save you a bit of, bit of money. Mm. And it's, well, as I mentioned, secure enough for most customers. Do note the disclaimer. This is all based on the, the base fee you're paying for your services. So no bandwidth, no uh, storage cost, no stop, no scaling, etc. And yes, that is a lot of money. Uh, I, I, I know because most customers or a lot of customers I'm working with, uh, only have about one to five different uh, web APIs, websites, and a SQL server, some storage accounts, and they're spending, let's say, a thousand euros per month, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. Uh, so then spending like 3,000 additional uh, bucks per month just to make a nice, secure environment <laughs> isn't in proportions. Uh, I also work with uh, some customers who are spending like uh, 100 to 200,000 euros per month on their, in on their Azure environment. And that's a whole different ballpark and they have a whole lot of different requirements. So this is a lot of money. Um, and yeah, it, it depends if you want to, if you want this kind of uh, uh, protection. So uh, the if you're if you're tight on 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 budget this is something you can uh, you can uh, look into uh which i'm looking into myself also and this is well uh like i said the the fee net uh, all of your data repositories in a fee net great way to start and only add front door in the mix and have front door connect to your app services and in the access restriction of your app services, you can state, well, I want front door to be allowed to it and check the header for the front door ID. This is something you need to specify in all of your, well, uh, app services, all of your applications, uh, which is okay. Uh, it still means your, your apps are ex exposed on the public internet. Well, not actually anymore because you have this extra section set in place, uh, but you still have some routing you need to do within front door. So uh, what you, what I had drawn first, have having front door connect to API management and API management connect to the rest of your environment. Now you have, well, all of your services uh, exposed to front door and front door needs to figure out how to route the traffic which can be a viable solution. And this only sets you back at, well, the, the cost of front door, uh, which uh, with the new premium uh, front door uh, isn't that expensive anymore. It's like, if I remember correctly, 300 euros. So it's still a lot of money for some customers, but it, it has a lot of cool features, uh, especially if you're working globally because the CDN and the dynamic app acceleration is, is great stuff still it's an additional 300 euros so that's it uh, for me for now uh, if you want to uh, contact me later uh, I'll, I'll be on, on slack uh, the next couple of like 10 hours uh, the ndc slack you can also reach out to me uh, later on on twitter via email or, or uh, 
if you want to read more about this this topics and other topics do check out my my blog and uh, with that i i give you a couple of minutes back of your time or if there are any questions uh, i don't see any chat over here um, so uh, if there are any questions uh, i'd uh, love to know <laughs>